Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Scranton City Council Chambers. Tonight we're going to be holding a public hearing concerning file of council number 54 of 2023, establishing regulations and restrictions for the location and use of lots, lands, buildings, and other structures, the height, number of stories, and size and bulk of buildings and structures, the density of population, off-street parking, similar accessory regulations in the city of Scranton, Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania and for said purposes, dividing the city of Scranton into districts and establishing the boundaries thereof, prescribing certain uniform regulations for each such district and providing for administrative enforcement and amendment of its provisions in accordance with the Pennsylvania Municipality, <laughs> Municipalities Planning Code, MPC 53 PS 10101, as amended. I would like to... Um, invite the public up uh, to speak this evening. We have, do have a sign-in sheet. We're going to uh, follow that sign-in sheet. I would ask all the speakers uh, that wish to address council, please state your name and address for the record. Um, any person who wishes to address council may do so uh, this evening after I've exhausted the, the actual sign-in list. Um, and I would ask that we're, we're going to abide by the five minute uh, council rule this evening because we have obviously a lot of people that are uh, interested in speaking this evening on the zoning issue. It's important to note zoning issue will not be voted on this evening. Um, obviously, we had the opportunity to hear from Geisinger this evening. Now uh, is that time for a public hearing to hear from the public. So I'm gonna start with the uh, initial sign in sheet. And once again, I would ask, if you need to have conversations with someone, I would ask that you do that in the hall um, so that each individual that is about to speak can be heard. We want to hear everything that everyone has to say. So please, I would ask you to respect each individual that comes up to the podium. Our first speaker is Bridget Kozarowski, Pennsylvania State Representative. Thank you, and thank you to the council members. My name is Bridget Kozarowski, and I uh, represent the city of Scranton. And I come here tonight with the full knowledge and the awareness of sensitivity to the folks that live in and around the hospital, whether you be a homeowner, you visit your family there, or that's where you grew up. And with that being said, as a registered nurse, I've been a nurse for 29 years, I worry about accessibility to the quality health care here in Lackawanna County, in our city. I remember touring the CMC hospital in 1989 when the trauma center was open for the first time. I got to go as a little girl and I went with my father, who's a retired orthopedic surgeon here in Scranton, and he served the city for 45 years. And it was an unbelievable, cool experience to see this new trauma center in this emergency room. That being said, I had the opportunity to tour Geisinger CMC emergency room a couple weeks ago. And being in there, watching and seeing what I saw, it saddened me. It saddened me because the infrastructure of that facility hasn't really changed since 1989. However, the acuity of patients that we see now, the volume of patients, has changed dramatically. And it is a disservice to our community that we are not able to, we deserve quality health care here. We deserve quality uh, care that is accessible and we should be able to recruit and retain specialists, especially in emergency rooms. And as, as I heard earlier this evening, you know, we can't treat our patients if they're not in the bed. And I know we have a workforce shortage. Do not get me wrong, I hear about this all the time. It is nationwide, especially in health care. But for our ability to recruit and retain professionals, healthcare professionals here in our city, we need to expand and invest in this hospital. I know nobody in this room is against healthcare. I'm quite aware of that. I'm sure no one in this room wants a family member to have to wait in a hallway, wants a family member in an emergency room, not to have accessibility to a specialist, especially pediatrics, neurosurgery, orthopedics, trauma. You know, we don't want to have to send our patients down the turnpike to Lehigh Valley or to Philadelphia 
in a, in a crisis. And they go by themselves, keep in mind. The family can't go. The family has to go in a car on their own and, and find them in wherever the hospital in a foreign setting. You know, we want to take care of our community here. A lot of our, our health care professionals have grown up in this community. And that's who they want to take care of. I worry about the expansion and the, and the ability for us to do that here in the city without being supportive of the, the ways that this Geisinger CMC needs to do this. It's touring that emergency room saddened me because I did not want anybody, anybody I love, anybody you in this room love, to be able to have to sit in an emergency room setting like that. And I know we talk about the parking garage, I know we talk about you know, what kind of specialties are we going to bring in? Is it pediatrics? Is it emergency room? And it's fluid. Healthcare is fluid. Change is fluid. This is, it, this is what we have in healthcare. It's, it, and, but the acuity of patient care is essential to making our community safe. And that's what it's all about. The bottom line is making our, our families and the community members that live here, having, ha, making them be safe and feel like they can be, have health care and hospital accessibilities is important to everybody, whether you're a pediatric or you're an aging population. And, and it is you know, no secret that we have, uh, Pennsylvania has a very aging senior population, especially here in Lackawanna County. And we have to be ready to be able to take care. I mean, I'm aging. I would like them to be able to take care of me someday when I need to you know, access health care. So I'm, I'm here tonight to, to really ask you to consider. I know this is a really hard decision. I have listened to people. I have listened to people that live in the area of the hospital. And I put myself in their shoes. And I understand why this is such a hard decision, because it is going to change the makeup of their neighborhood. And I understand that. But living near a hospital, sometimes that risk is that. But the risk of losing accessibility to good quality health care, I believe, is much larger. So thank you for hearing this tonight. And I, I hope that you can consider that need of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kazarowski. Mary Beth Mikulavitz. Good evening. My name is Mary Beth Michael Achek, and I live in Scranton all my life, uh, the Hill section, for the last 40 years. What I just handed at City Council is some pictures of an accident that happened on Friday in the 200 block of Colfax Avenue, which will be the block that is supposed to be bringing in the 100-foot garage. After looking at those pictures and speaking with the neighbors, People speed in the morning to get to work on time, and we're not sure if that's the case in those pictures, but I feel parking garages, whether they're 45 feet or 100 feet, do not belong in a residential section. I feel that maybe they should be off campus, shuttle your people in, and build lower clinics there. I know one of the biggest things is the ER. Put a smaller ER across the street for your non-critical patients, your non-trauma patients, people that may need stitches or have a broken you know, ankle or something like that, something that's not going to be like an accident or like a stabbing or something like that, which could possibly free up your beds on the other side. Have a smaller clinic across the street, do your ER there. With building two garages, it's probably going to take maybe three to five years before better health care comes into the area. I don't understand why Geisinger will not build. They have so much space there. Build newer buildings there now and get to your health care sooner and than the garages. I just think garages are not needed in, in a residential section. And as for the current parking that they have now, I walk every morning, and rainy days, I took a walk in the one guy singer garage, went all the way up to the top, came all the way down to the bottom. There was 124 open spots at 9.15 in the morning, which means your whole day shift would have been there. 
So they're claiming that there's a two-year waiting period. I don't think all those people were on vacation. So it seems like there are open spots, and I'm thinking maybe the employees just don't want to pay. So they pay $10 a month out of a check, which comes out to $260 a year. So these people that don't want to pay, will they end up in Nayog Park? And, but I really feel Geisinger probably has talented engineers and designers that they could rework these plans. And as for the garage down on the 200 block of Arthur, 100 feet is just crazy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Joanne Williams. Uh, good evening, uh, Joanne Williams. I live in the 200 block of Arthur Avenue, but also we had a home on the 200 block of Colfax. Now, I just want to state listening to them, and I had met Ron and Renee, I think it is. Um, first of all, I have stated here before that yes, there was, we have wonderful health care in Scranton, okay? And I also had to go to the emergency room a few times, and I saw how overcrowded it was. But now let's talk about, and, and I know they need to do something, but at the expense of a neighborhood. Um, they talked about the open communication between them and the neighbors. I remember one meeting, that's it. A hotline, that's news to me tonight and a lot of other people sitting out here. So, you know, as far as doing that, like, they're not being a good neighbor communicating with us to let us know what their plans are. And also, um, over the weekend, I don't know what they were doing in the lots, you know, the lots, the lots in 200 block of Colfax Avenue that once, once was beautiful homes. The noise from Saturday morning to Saturday evening was outrageous. Sunday morning. So can you imagine when they start building, or whenever they start building, let's think about the people on Roslyn Avenue. Let's think about the people on the 200 block of Wheeler in Linden Street. Between the noise and the air pollution, it's not good. That was our neighborhood. Yeah, I remember the Hanneman Hospital. I was born in it. And I remember when CMC started building. But you know what? They should have taken this hospital and taken it up to a mountain and built it. Now, you know what I mean? But I'm going to tell you, they're not being honest and truthful. They have no plans to put before you, yet they want you to give them the zoning. You need to think. And the other people in other neighborhoods need to think, too. That you don't think this can happen to your neighborhood? You have to set the example now. You need to. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. Richard Foley. Richard Foley, 314 Pear Street. Uh, President King, Vice President McAndrew, City Council members, Good evening. Uh, I'm Rich Foley. I'm a senior council representative with the Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters. It is my privilege to represent the men and women of Carpenters Local 445 in Scranton. I come before you tonight to speak in favor of the two parking garages Geisinger CMC wishes to build in the city. I am confident that these projects will be built by the safest and best educated carpenters. Our carpenters earned family sustaining wages while providing health insurance for their families as well as a retirement for their future. Just as important projects like this are necessary 
for us to be able to employ and train additional apprentices. Apprentices who will be trained without the burden of tuition or a future that they're trying to pay down debt incurred through their education. Projects like this provide opportunity for city and local residents. The city has been fortunate to have a first class medical facility and a partner in the community. Geisinger CMC has invested many, many millions of dollars into this facility and continues to employ countless local residents. Without these parking garages, Geisinger may be forced to move future expansion of services or facilities to other communities. This would lead to less local employment and longer travel distances for care. I acknowledge every large-scale construction project changes the landscape. However, I believe this one comes with many benefits. It will allow for improved parking for the hospital while providing relief to the local streets and possibly Nayog Park. It will allow Geisinger to continue to grow and improve within the city. Most importantly, it will allow employment to grow, first under the construction, then for the life of the facility. We need to provide opportunities for our youth to stay and raise their families here. I am asking City Council to support this project, and I would like to thank everyone for their time. Thank you, Mr. Foley. Conrad Bosley. Mr. King, uh, Conrad Bosley is an expert witness for the neighbors, so I'm going to ask him some questions during the five minutes allotted for his presentation. So is Edmund Skikiti speaking, or is Conrad Bosley? Conrad Bosley is, is speaking. This is his testimony. I'm just going to ask the questions. OK. All right? Sure. OK. Thank you. Mr. Bosley, would you identify yourself for the members of city council? My name is Conrad Bosley. I'm a resident of the city of Scranton. I'm a certified residential appraiser under the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And have you concentrated your appraisal business primarily on residential properties? Yes. I'm, you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes. My license is in certified residential appraisal work. And are you familiar with the neighborhood in the vicinity of Geisinger Community Medical Center? Yes, I am. And at the request of the Geisinger CMC neighbors, did you have an opportunity to look at that area and look uh, at the area of proposed development as explained by the Kaiser representatives this evening? Yes, I did. And do you have an opinion whether the proposed parking garages as uh, portrayed or discussed this evening on the 400 block of Colfax and the 200 block of Colfax will have any effect on the fair market value of the neighboring real estate? It's my professional opinion that the change of the area to permit parking garages would have a negative effect on the property owners in the 200 block and the 400 block of Arthur Avenue, as well as some of the properties that go along Vine Street and Linden Street, the corner of uh, Colfax and Vine and Colfax and Linden. And to what extent, if at all, would additional vehicular traffic have on property values? Uh, the additional traffic value, uh, tr the additional traffic would cause more uh, traffic and more congestion around the area. Parking problems would probably increase, and there would be more difficulty for the people who live on those two blocks to enjoy the, their life that they're used to now. Now, with regard to the, any construction period for garages or whatever it may be, uh, how difficult would it be, if at all, for a homeowner to try to sell their home in the midst of some substantial construction activity? Uh, with the unknown, uh, unknown situation that would come about because of construction going on there and the, the disruption of the neighborhood, and also with the unknown of what would appear there 
that was not visual to them at the time that they are going to make that decision. It would also have a negative effect on any buyer looking to buy one of the properties that was offered for sale there. <clears throat> have the opinions that you expressed this evening to City Council but based upon your extensive experience of background in residential real estate appraisals? Yes, they are. Thank you. And if anyone from Council has a question for Mr. Bosley? No, we appreciate your input and we'll take it under consideration as Thank we you. consider this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jamie Wilcox. Good evening. My name is Jamie and I have been a registered nurse in the emergency department at Geisinger for more than eight years. Despite being on the administrative side of things these days, I still pick up overtime and work side by side with our staff regularly. I am your bedside nurse. Healthcare looks today looks much different than it did when I graduated nursing school. We've had a global pandemic, many nurses have left the bedside, and patient acuity and volumes are increasing, creating a much more stressful environment in our department. Pair that with the stress of having to try to care for patients when you don't have the space and equipment to do so, and you've ultimately taken on a career that is mentally, physically, and emotionally exhausting. I want to take a moment to paint a picture for you. A gentleman arrives to the emergency department with his mother, who has been battling constipation for one week. Despite being uncomfortable, mom's vital signs are within normal limits. She is awake and oriented and seems to be a fairly stable patient. After triage, she's placed into the waiting room because the 38 rooms and 15 hallway beds of the ER are filled with a mix of ED patients and admitted patients waiting for rooms upstairs, a common occurrence at GCMC. Finally, about five hours later, a hallway bed becomes available for mom, and she's moved there to a stretcher where she awaits a provider. Her labs and abdominal x-ray in the waiting room are seemingly stable, vitals reassessed and stable, and a CAT scan was ordered after she was seen by a provider once in her hallway bed. While awaiting transport's arrival, all of a sudden mom reports that she isn't feeling well and within seconds goes into cardiac arrest. Now remember, the ED is at maximum capacity. Mom had to wait five hours just to get into that hallway bed, and now her life is threatened. Staff flock to the area to establish an artificial airway and administer CPR. Mom is intubated in the hallway. Staff do their best to shield all of this from patients in surrounding hallway beds. Mom needs oxygen and suction, and staff have to rely on portable canisters since she's not in a traditional room. CPR remains in progress, and once an airway is established, mom is finally able to be rushed into the trauma bay to continue resuscitative efforts. Now, I want everyone to think about this being your own mother, father, or even themselves. People often forget about what, are, what is or could be happening in the emergency department until it ha it's their time of need. One day you're driving to work listening to your favorite song on the radio, and the next you're being woken up out of a medically induced coma and weaned off a ventilator. Your life saved because of the care you received after being struck by a reckless driver. The story I shared about mom isn't fictitious. It happened in our department a few months back, and it could happen again today or tomorrow. Our, de our department is constantly stretched to its absolute limits, maximum patient volumes, maximum capacity, and we absolutely cannot provide the excellent care that we do in the space we have. It simply can't happen, and I am telling you that as someone who has seen a huge growth in both volume and the severity of illness in the patients we see, we are bursting at the seams. I walked into work yesterday to a department that was drowning in every sense of the word. 80 patients deep at 7 a.m. with 27 in the waiting room, others packed into every hallway, bed, corner, and chair you could find. 38 admitted patients waiting to go upstairs to a room. We were able to get some extra help there, but there was no place to put anyone else. Even with all the hands in the world, it is impossible to provide care when there's nowhere to put people. Our waiting room patients and their families are agitated as they wait to be seen, and I understand their frustrations and I empathize with them, but we are simply doing our best with the resources we have. Placing patients in hallway beds compromises both patient privacy to them and other patients in surrounding rooms. Patients in hallway beds can easily overhear conversations at the nurse's station involving other patients, have to talk about their own medical information to a provider in front of other patients and staff, and have an all-around lack of privacy and resources that patients placed into rooms have. I stepped away from my full-time position at GCMC in the summer of 2021 to pursue a career, career as an ED travel nurse, and I swear the only reason I would ever stop traveling was if an administrative role in the ED at GCMC ever opened up. And in October of 2022, I came back to Geisinger full-time as an administrative coordinator. I am, the only reason I was willing to do so was because this team is my family, and I believe so wholeheartedly in the care our ED physicians, nurses, and staff provide. It is second to none. I want them to feel appreciated for their hard work, but our space constraints challenge our ability to provide care we are proud of when it comes to access to critical equipment and the dignity our patients deserve. 
I've also seen what a facility with adequate space to treat patients can do for both the patient and staff experience, and let me tell you, the difference is unreal. The EMS crews who line our hallways waiting for a bed for their patient can't serve our community if they are inside the walls of our room, waiting, waiting for room. I'm here this evening to advocate for our ear the much-needed care this community deserves. We absolutely cannot continue to provide the care with the space we have to work with. We just lost an ED in this city, and I have a feeling it's only going to get worse. If we want Geisinger CMC to continue to be our local hospital for certified stroke, heart attack, and trauma care, we must be allowed to grow. As a nurse who knows what lies ahead if we don't, I ask that you please consider your family, friends, and neighbors. I dread the day that anyone in this community comes through our ambulance bay doors and we simply don't have a care area to treat you in. Lives are truly at stake. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jamie. Tim Schwartz. Yes, I'm Tim Schwartz. I'm, um, I live 823 Myrtle Street, and I'm the president of the Hill Neighborhood Association. Um, I'm here tonight to support the neighbors around uh, Geisinger um, over the last year. Uh, I think it was about a year ago now where I had the first meeting with the leaders of the Neighborhood Association with the zoning um, about the zoning map. And what I remember is that the Green Ridge Association said, you know, we really have a problem with this. And then um, they said, well, okay, we can change that for you. And then uh, South Scranton Neighborhood Association said, well, you know, we really have a problem with this. And we said, okay, we can change that as well. And I said, well, you we have a real problem with this as well. We were concerned about the neighbors and the neighborhood around the, the, um, around the hospital and nothing got changed, nothing was even considered. Um, it's been a weird process through and through. In the last year, um, every Monday night, I've sat with the residents around the hospital, um, heard their anger, heard their pain, heard their uh, anxiety, heard their stress, heard how they've carried for a year um, this zoning map and the changes that are being made to their neighborhood. Uh, changes being made to houses that they've lived in for 60 years, 80 years, that they've lived in with their parents, that they've seen the city change a bit, but they've raised their kids in these houses. And, and it breaks my heart to listen to this, the, the anxiety and fear and, and broken, their brokenheartedness over the last year. Um, it's been a weird process through and through, and so I'm here to advocate for those neighbors. Um, what I've heard tonight is people say, you know, you need to imagine what it would be like uh, to have somebody come into your room and tell you about the cancer diagnosis you have with somebody else in that room. Uh, you need to imagine what it is for this person. You need to imagine how we can only, only have one pediatric um, ER room. Um, I'd invite you to imagine as well the pain and anxiety and stress and heartache that the neighbors around the hospital have gone through over the last year and will continue to go through over the next 10 years um, if the zoning doesn't change. Um, but I wouldn't say imagine it. You know, there's a gallery full of people who can tell you about that, 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 that this has been terrible for their lives. I think everybody here would say, we need more ER space in this city. We need better medical services in this city. We don't want to have to drive to Philadelphia or New York or Allentown or wherever when we get sick. Everybody would say that. But I'm saying not at the cost of the, the quality of life um, for a whole neighborhood. Uh, it's not just Colfax or Arthur. It's that whole neighborhood uh, that the quality of life is going to be affected. Uh, it was said tonight, let me see if I can find it because I typed it down. The last thing we want to do is impact the quality of life of people while, we're, while we are impacting the quality of life of people. Um, those neighbors are, are, are set for 10 years of construction, I don't even know how long, of construction noises, of lighting, of backup uh, sounds, of all of that. Um, we're affecting the quality of life and that can't change. Um, but these residents, people's lives, families are too important to put through that, to, 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 to sacrifice them on behalf of more medical services. I think many times when there is um, a plan put out, there's always a better opportunity. There's always a better idea. Um, whether it's going digging down underneath and having a two-level ER or, or down underneath for more parking or whatever it may be, there's got to be a better solution than, than sacrificing the quality of living of, of 
10 different blocks around the hospital. And so I would encourage you, as you try to make this decision, to think if there, can there please be a better idea, a better plan? You know, I, I live a block from that barren uh, block between Moses Taylor and Regional. There's nothing there. And what I suspect is that 10 or 15 years ago, before I moved here, Somebody had a really good idea that these hospitals need to expand or connect. I remember driving uh, from the highway back to my house and there was this big uh, poster on that barren block of what it would look like, you know, kind of just building blocks or something like that. It's still barren. There's still nothing there. It's a great idea to bring um, health care into the city, more dedicated health care into the city. Uh, but I can't save at the expense of my neighbors. I can't say it at the expense of people who've lived there for such a long time. Uh, so I, I know you have a great choice ahead of you, and uh, please hear my support and the Hill Neighborhood Association's support uh, for these neighbors and their livelihoods and their quality of life. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. <laughs> Barry Bennigan. Good evening, Council. My name is Barry Bennington. Uh, I'm a resident of 1612 Linden Street here in Scranton. Uh, I'm gonna keep this short and sweet because I gotta go. Uh, <laughs> I'm asking you to rethink and reconsider the zoning issue on a 200 block of Colfax Avenue to keep it, uh, I believe it's called civic institution or institutional instead of civic. Uh, we need to limit the height of the structure from 100 to 45. Uh, the flow of traffic as of right now up Linden Street is incredible and has increased, uh, I would say, 100% since Geisinger bought CMC. Um, and there's also bus stops in that area as well, elementary bus stops. Uh, I think you really need to consider the zoning issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennington. Maurice Schumacher. Marie Schumacher, 1799 East Mountain Road in Scranton. Um, I know that Geisinger owns a lot of real estate, and I cannot understand why, if they need something that's dedicated to, say, pediatrics, they couldn't build on some of that land that they have, or even empty out some of what they have. But um, that is not the real reason that I'm here. I'm here because I'm concerned about Nayog Park. I have loved Nayog Park since I've been young and went up there every night when I was still working here. Um, somehow, just looking across the street, I mean, Arthur Avenue was the place. I can remember, I think it was the Fruhans house, they even had an elevator. And, you know, nobody else had an elevator. And that was the place to live then. Um, but looking across the street from Naog Park to a lot of cement is going to break the, the beauty of being there. And I, I really think it's a, it's a big mistake to do what you, I know that you want to do very much and you want to please, I'm sure, our mayor. Um, but think about the people. Think about all these people out here who are gonna lose their homes, what they're going through right now. They count. And I think you should think about them first and I'm sure that Geisinger has a lot of brains and they can figure something else out that will let them do everything they want in, as far as expanding 
what they do, uh, which is health care, not real estate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schumacher. <laughs> David Rinaldi. Good evening, Council. Um, thanks for having this public hearing. Uh, I wanted, I'm Dave Rinaldi, 212 Colfax. Um, I'm the property owner there, uh, along with myself and three neighbors. We're the only houses on the 200 block of Colfax. But I wanted to make a few comments about the presentation that we heard from Geisinger tonight. Um, first thing I want to uh, emphasize to Council is, you know, they talked about streets around the parking garages, but they only mentioned Roslyn. Did they mention the properties on Colfax? Did they mention the properties that are going to be dwarfed by the garage on Wheeler? No. And then when they said, without expert testimony, that the value of the properties would go up, they took into consideration the entire Hill Neighborhood Association. I mean, the whole entire Hill Neighborhood not just the people who are directly affected. So um, I sort of got the feeling that I was in the land of Oz tonight listening to them, because there was a lot of things that they said. One, they talked about the development process. I, I know you, you, you might remember that slide, but the first thing was zoning first. If they weren't a mega million dollar corporation, they wouldn't be looking for zoning first. Anybody who served on a zoning hearing board or a planning commission knows that there were ways, there are ways, and even if council amends it to the 45 feet, they can still get a variance if that's a big enough hardship. So they have many ways to proceed, uh, but um, that was just one of them. Uh, the other, um, I don't believe, anyway, that they're even acting good faith one minute. They talked about having two meetings. So I want to talk about the first one because I was there. Matter of fact, I invited by email Dr. Rothschild. Um, that's the one where the first thing out of their mouth was, we've already taken over Nayog Park. Now, there's there, Every time you ask about a study, oh, we can't do that first. So we got a chicken and an egg here. They want you to put the egg first. They want you to change the zoning. There's really, um, uh, there's no reason. There are avenues they can use under the current ordinance or if council decides to reduce that height for the 200 block of Colfax, they can go to the zoning hearing board. So there's many ways to do this. They wouldn't commit to anything, not a thing tonight. You ask them their plans? No, we don't have plans. You have to do something first. Then if you do it, hey, maybe we'll do it. But then again, we don't know what we're going to run into, so maybe we won't. Just like that example that came up at the end of the session. Uh, you know, um, so I want, the thing that I want to emphasize is that we're really talking about a community, that neighborhood. We're talking about specific individuals, the people on Colfax, the people on Wheeler, the people on Roslyn, in regard to the 100 foot structure. Uh, but uh, we have, they didn't address any of those specifically. Any of those specifically. Um, so, what I'd like to uh, finish with is, um, you know, they talked about the, uh, the emergency care. Uh, and they talked about, and they told you there's going to be a 10%, 10% expansion in the beds. 10%. We're not talking about 50, 60, 70 beds. 10%. I mean, seriously? They have to destroy a neighborhood to increase that by 10%, which they said is, is their biggest thing. And let me address the, the idea of privacy. Well, what do you think 
um, insurance pays more for? A private room or semi-private? So there, are, there were examples in everything they said that this is profit-driven, profit-driven. And they don't care about the neighborhood. The idea that they're going to set up a committee sometime after you agree to everything that they want, and if they do do the expansion, I mean, how can anybody, anybody come to an, an idea with that, an agreement? But thank you very much. I appreciate the thank time. Thank you, Mr. Rinaldi. Andrea Mulrang. Good evening, council members. My name is Andrea Mulrine. I live on Woodlawn Street in Scranton. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. I am a Scrantonian. I am a proud University of Scranton alumna. And I am also a proud Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine employee. Many of you know me as a community leader, but tonight I am speaking simply as a member of my community, not representing any of the organizations that I do volunteer work with. CMC has always been and is now an important asset for the greater Scranton community. From its birth as Hahnemann Hospital in 1897 to the merger with Westside Hospital in 1962, which created Community Medical Center, this hospital has served our community. Since Geisinger acquired CMC in 2012, they've consistently invested in the hospital, offering more high-quality health care programs and services in Scranton, which allows those needing care to stay close to home. Geisinger's investment in our community is front and center with the medical school. The Commonwealth Medical College, TCMC originally, or as we love to call it, this community's medical college, was established by a group of visionary community leaders to fill a critical need. We need more doctors serving the community. The college's integration with Geisinger has provided both stability for the college and new opportunities for our students. Scholarships for local students have been provided by generous foundations and donors. And in addition, as you did hear earlier, Geisinger created the Abigail Geisinger Scholars Program for students who want to stay in the region to practice in a primary care field. They can graduate with no medical school debt. Geisinger continues to add new residency programs, giving additional opportunities for students to remain in the region as they continue their training. I can't speak about the college without discussing revitalization, especially of downtown Scranton. Having this influx of faculty, staff, and students has propelled investment in our city with multiple developers investing in our historic buildings. Downtown apartments are at a premium, and we continue to see the birth of new businesses. Many of you know I've spoken to candidates for public office for a long time, and we've talked about brain drain. We all know Scranton's history, first as a thriving industrial center for, excuse me, for iron and anthracite coal. Next came the garment industry with low paying jobs and piecework. Members of my husband's family worked in that industry. We had an attempt at making Scranton a hub of call centers sometime in the 90s, also not the best paying jobs. When we talk about economic development now and stopping brain drain, we should be focused on embracing two of our strong suits, EDS and MEDS, education and healthcare. These are industries that bring living wage, long-term job opportunities, careers that attract talented people to our area and keep our next generation in the region. The continued growth of GCMC is important to Scranton. Traditionally, people leave for New York and Philadelphia for elite health care. If we can offer those services here, no one has to leave home for outstanding care. Our aging population, including me, needs care close to home. I had knee replacement surgery in 2019 at CMC and received excellent care. No one has to go to Allentown, Philly, or New York for exceptional orthopedics. Then there's another story. Last year this time, I went into the ED. I was one of those people in that uh, hallway bed. I spent five days in CMC last year in a semi-private room, and I dare anyone to say that that's a good way 
to, re to uh, recover and to get well. You can't, sh you can't get well in a space you share with someone who has their own list of medical problems. And a private room would have made my stay much less stressful. I also had an aunt who has since passed away that I was a caretaker for with dementia. She was in the hospital three times in the emergency room in those, in those hallway beds. Not a good solution. In order to support excellent health care right here in Scranton, economic development within our city, and career and life-changing opportunities for our people, I urge City Council to see the value of approving the citywide rezoning plan for the future of our community. Thank you for your time this evening and for your del deliberations on this important issue. Thank you, Andrew. Phyllis Reinhardt. Members of the Scranton City Council, I was going to greet the Geisinger officers, uh, but and residents of Scranton. I'm Phyllis Reinhardt. I married a Scrantonian. We raised our children here in the Hill section, and I graduated from the University of Scranton. Shortly after that, I left, I took a federal job in 1979. I tell you this because I left as the university had begun their expansion in the Hill section. When I returned in 2000, I found streets were not merely one way, they were private conveyances. Linden Street around the school was now part of the university campus. Homes that had generated top property tax dollars were now tax-exempt dorms. The houses that remained in the blocks around the university looked unkept, and I'm sure the city no longer collected top property tax dollars on those now absentee landowners' student off-campus housing. It was stated at a recent council meeting that 51% of properties in Scranton are now tax exempt. My first question to the members of the Scranton City Council is this. Can the city afford to lose more critical property tax dollars from upscale homes in the Hill section? Tax dollars have already been lost through Geisinger's purchase of homes on Colfax. How many homes will we lose to the tax rolls? How many will be purchased for low-income rentals because nobody else will want to buy these beautiful homes after Geisinger's expansion becomes reality? I mentioned the university uh, uh, expansions because, and Geisinger's proposed, because any time that these expansions take place in the city, it costs the residents. Not only, obviously, to the taxpayers, because when properties are lost, generally taxes for the rest of us are going to go up. It's, we mentioned that there will be a traffic problem, so I won't uh, mention that. Um, but obviously, aside from the monetary cost, there is also those intrinsic values, such as will you have the funds to do both recreational ref uh, repair, uh, say, of the uh, playground at Nayog, and also take care of the uh, water runoff that is going to occur from these parking uh, garages. Uh, parents, I don't know if they are aware, but 53% of our school funding comes from local taxes. Lost tax properties will reduce school funding in Scranton. 
Will tax dollars for recreational? I've already spoke to that. So I um, am certain that, well, listening to the, the presentation, I wonder if the council really can make an informed vote on this zoning uh, next week. Um, so, thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. I'm sorry, thank you. five minutes is up. Thank you, <laughs> Jess Nolan. Jessica Nolan, Vine Street in Scranton. Um, I wanted to start actually with some questions. Um, first, pointing out the many questions not answered or deflected by the hospital. Uh, so for example, Mr. Smurl asked how many beds will be added to the ER. The answer was basically, we'll see. Um, there was a question about whether or not it was fully staffed that veered into very strange directions about junior high school students being trained to enter the medical profession. Um, I'm gonna take that as a no, that it's not fully staffed. Um, Dr. Rothschild asked about why NAOC parking can't be used. Um, this question was never answered. Uh, instead, we were told that if we go lower in height, we'll have fewer spaces than we do now. Um, and then to further confuse us, Mr. Beer said that parking garages are really expensive, and if he could wave a magic wand and do surface parking, he would, when that's exactly what NAOC currently provides, surface parking. Um, they were asked, can we be promised that if these garages are built, there will be no more parking in NAOG? The answer was sort of a, we'll do our best. Uh, Mr. Schuster asked what I thought was an excellent question related to parking and beds and some of the previous questions. Um, how can the number of parking spots be determined if we don't know the number of beds? Um, again, I'm very confused as to how the number of parking spots can be so inflexible while simultaneously telling us that everything else about the expansion is indeterminate. So lots of stuff we don't know, but we know we have to have all these parking spots. Um, Dr. Rothschild asked another great question about community benefits agreement. Um, that's something I would like to know early about, uh, know more about. Um, and the response was basically, no, it's too early in the process. We can't provide that. Um, now I have some questions for council to, th council to think about. I don't necessarily want you to respond right now. Um, so we saw a picture of the area around Naog and the proposed expansion, and as far as I could tell from that map, the only thing planned for the east side of the 200 block of Colfax was a pocket park in the areas they've acquired. Why are they seeking an institutional zone if all they want to do is put in a park that could be put in under city mixed-use residential zoning? Um, there was a question about what the facade of the building will look like. Um, so again, a question for you to consider, um, is GCMC legally bound to build the structures as they've been described here today? There was a question about how community will be involved in the process. The nurse manager gave us a very nice answer about how they want to engage in a robust process of dialogue. They implied that they would sort of present us with options and we would sort of get to take our pick. Um, are they legally obligated to dialogue with neighbors as they've promised to do? Are they legally obligated to provide attractive landscaping? Are these things that we can leave here today knowing that if you vote in favor of their zoning next week that we're gonna get all these great things? Um, I know the answer to that question and so do you. Um, in fact, if you listen to Mr. Beer tonight, he actually told us the reality of how the design work for the expansion will proceed. Um, GCMC is very aware of the costs associated with this work. Um, it, it's about the money. Um, he told us engineering, fares are two to, engineering fees are two to three percent. Um, we were told it doesn't make sense to invest in detailed drawings this early in the process. He told us that inflation will determine if they have discretionary funds to do some of the landscaping and design work. So basically, if the economic conditions aren't right, we get an ugly, cheap building. There's no guarantee. We're here today to ask City Council to amend the current draft of the SAPA zoning plans that the west side of the 200 block of Colfax is zoned institutional rather than civic. I would point out that the institutional zoning would still allow the hospital to expand its footprint. This is not a neighborhood win scenario. There is still an expansion that's gonna happen and large structures that are gonna be built. Um, it's not a request to prevent expansion, but rather to mitigate the impact of commercial construction on the quality of life on what is still today a residentially zoned neighborhood as of today. Um, and so 
For almost a year now, we've been working with an organized group of neighbors to preserve the livability of our neighborhood in the face of these proposed zoning changes. Um, both the process that led to the zoning changes as well as the specifics of the proposed expansion matter. Others have spoken about the specifics of the proposal, so I would like to say a little bit in the less than minute I have about the process. So we learned last spring that the city at the request of GCMC planned to rezone parts of Colfax Avenue to allow for the hospital to expand the current footprint. Um, I wanna thank the current president of the Greenridge Neighborhood Association because that's basically how we found out. Prior to that meeting, neither the city nor the hospital had reached out to the neighbors or the HNI to solicit feedback about the proposed changes. So once again, today I think also illustrated symbolically this point, GCMC has this privileged position at the table of power and the neighbors are left knocking at the front door begging to be let in. Why wasn't there a more thoughtful city planning process that engaged the community? And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Jess. Julie Bioli. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Julie Byerly, and I live at 749 North Webster in the Hill section. I'm also serving as the Dean of Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. I've lived in Scranton just 15 months now. I live in the Hill section, and my husband and I walk our dog almost every day around Nayog Park and around GCMC. Uh, I came here to Scranton because of the opportunity that the partnership between Geisinger Health System and Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine provides to create and fulfill the vision of the founders of our medical school to create doctors to serve our region. Geisinger invests a tremendous amount in our medical school, including the millions of dollars per year of, Geis of Abigail Geisinger scholarship support for students who do commit to working in our region. I love that opportunity and I care about the future of our community. I'm a pediatrician and as a pediatrician I understand the value of health care. As a dean of our school, I am working with you hard to ensure that Scranton has a thriving future. I want to be able to recruit the best and the brightest here to our school and to become the doctors for our region. The proposed expansion of GCMC impacts all of this. It impacts the neighborhood I call home and the success of the school I work in every day and it affects the success of recruiting and re retaining the doctors that we need. It's a complex question and it's important that the benefits of the decision that you make outweigh the risks. And I can understand the position of those who are not, who don't want large scale construction close to home. Nayog Park really is lovely and I believe it can and will be even with this project. As has been stated many times, the current facility is not what we need for the people of Scranton with regard to their clinical care, but it is also not what we need to recruit and retain a health profession workforce that we want to serve here. We have to make it better. We have to address how crowded it is, not only for our patients, but also for our learners. Our learners set foot in our facility here in Scranton, and they don't want to be here. They want to go to a place that cares and creates a clinical environment where they can thrive and where they can see themselves working successfully in the long term, where health care they perceive is valued and invested in by the community. I worry about what it would mean if we don't fix this problem. I worry how we'll take our medical school students who learn in this beautiful building in Scranton and then have to send them into clinical environments in other places. There is value beyond just the clinical care that I'd like to see. I've seen firsthand how hard, how teaching hospitals can impact the well-being of communities. By aligning with our medical school, which we're so fortunate to have here in Scranton, teaching hospitals add value to communities while they train doctors and nurses. The quality of the care is increased in a teaching environment. Research can be done. Patients can have access to clinical trials that provide opportunities for them. Residency and fellowship training programs can grow when there is space for them to grow. 
This vibrant teaching and learning environment in a beautiful clinical setting makes for great neighbors who come here as young people aspiring to be doctors, train in these settings, grow roots while they, hear, while they are living here, and become the physicians that our founders envisioned when they created our medical school. I see the improvement of GCMC as providing the programmatic growth we need in our area for the clinical care of our community members and crucial to helping us attract and retain the healthcare professional workforce that we need to provide that care in the future. Supporting this project is support of our medical school, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Julie. Uh, the next speaker, I, I can't really read the second name. It's Brian, is it Carnes or Kramer? Brian Frank? Yep. Okay, thank you. 315 Cottage Avenue. My name is Brian Frank. I'm a double board certified trauma and critical care and acute care surgeon at CMC, and I want to thank the council for allowing me to speak on uh, Geisinger's behalf. I've lived in Lackawanna County and treated this community for, over, or for almost seven years, and prior to my work at CMC, I trained at Christiana Care, an 1,100-bed, mostly private bed, level one trauma center in Delaware, and subsequently at the University of Pennsylvania, where I did my trauma and critical care fellowship. Uh, I moved up here to be with my in-laws, who have lived in this community for three generations. I take deep pride in the care we provide our patients, nearly 3,000 trauma patients alone in the last year, and recognize we can do more, but are limited by space and resources. When I arrived in 2016, we treated approximately 1,500 trauma patients, and this number has doubled in a short time with the closure of other emergency departments. This is only going to increase over the next 12 months. Moreover, the population in Northeast Pennsylvania is growing. Culture and Cultural and educational opportunities are expanding, but we as a hospital have not been able to grow to keep up with this pace. The time is now to make these overdue changes. The constraints are impacting our experiences as patients, and further delay will only compound this. On a typical day, we're notified at about 6.30 in the morning regarding capacity status. What was once an unusual occurrence is now part of the daily routine. The hospital is routinely over 100% capacity, but this is not just a number. And for every percentage point, one of our neighbors, friends, or loved ones is experiencing one of the worst days of their lives, but doing so in an unnecessarily public way. Their stories are what I want to share with you now. On March 20th, there was a horrible triple shooting in Westside. The events of that day have been well reported by the lay press. Uh, I'm not going to recount their experiences. But uh, at CMC, what has been told you is we have two resuscitation or trauma bays. And that's where we provide multiple emergent life-saving interventions. But on March 20th, what wasn't reported in the press was that there was a patient who had passed away in trauma room one. The family was in the room with that patient grieving when the alert of these GSWs came in. And what wasn't reported was needing to usher that grieving family out of the room, moving the recently deceased patient into the hallway momentarily while we struggled to find an acceptable place to allow them to grieve just so that we continue to try to care for the patients of Scranton. What wasn't reported was a discomfort of that family who couldn't be allowed to grieve in place because our facility is too limited by its current size. Unfortunately, it's not just a one-off. As an acute care surgeon, I treat patients with unexpected surgical emergencies like perforations or blockages that need surgery. Sometimes this is because of an unexpected cancer. And I just want you to imagine for a moment that you found yourself or a loved one in that position. And due to our current capacity constraints, most if not all of our floor beds are semi-private, meaning you will have a roommate. When time comes where I enter the room and share your pathology with you, I'll draw the curtain to give you a sense of privacy and I'll sit on the bed and hold your hand as we talk. But at the end of that conversation where I share the news of your cancer, this deeply intimate conversation is one you shared with a stranger in the next bed. Worse yet is these capacity constraints are further impacting your ability to receive emergency care via EMS. Per regulation, EMS needs to provide a safe handoff when they arrive to the emergency department. When we are at capacity, again, a near daily occurrence, patients and by proxy EMS are held waiting for a bed in the emergency department. When beds are filled in the ED, there's nowhere for EMS to hand that patient off. What results is a traffic jam that has greater implications than slowing your drive home. Unfortunately, what that means for you is that if you call 911 and expect to have an emergency responder attend to you, your wait is longer. EMS is not as available as they once were, resulting in delays in emergency care. And when you arrive to the ED, assuming you are triaged to a bed and not to the waiting room, this is likely to be a hall bed, not because you're any less sick or because 
you are in fact ill, need emergency evaluation, but the only place we have to provide this care is in the hallway. On some days, we have to resort to triaging patients to the waiting room and caring for them there. This is not normal, this is not okay, and this must change. To be clear, I'm not here on my own behalf or on Geisinger's behalf, I'm here for this community. As your care provider, I don't want you to be waiting longer for EMS, hearing bad news sitting next to a stranger, or having to rush through your grief because more patients continue to come to the emergency department. Unfortunately, the time for debate, the time for deliberation, and the time for alternatives is long past. We don't have the luxury of time, and I hope you, the council, will approve the zoning ordinance as proposed so that this community can continue to receive the care and compassion that everybody deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frank. John L. Thomas. Doesn't appear as though Mr. Thomas is here. Um, that exhausts the sign-in list. So at this time, um, are, is there anyone else who would like to be heard? Uh, Doris Klosky, Colfax Avenue, Scranton. I'm going to keep this extremely short because mostly anything I wanted to say was already said by Mr. M Rinaldi and Ms. Um, Jessica Nolan. So basically the only thing that I want to say is it seems like there's a great deal of about training the people at Geisinger Medical School, which I think is absolutely wonderful, but they do get their free tuition one year for one year. So after four years, if their tuition's paid for, they can leave for another city and any other place they want to go. And most of the uh, hospitals, the better hospitals anyway, will pay student loans off for doctors that have graduated to get them to join their services all over the country. Um, one thing I did want to say about Geising, the emergency room, I spent a lot of time in there, and yes, I think they definitely need a bigger emergency room. We're not against that. We're only against the size of the garage. But um, I spend time in the beds, not in the hallways, luckily. And I still was there five, six hours because they only had like one or two doctors in the whole area. Now, I can't attest to that being today because this was probably within the last four years. Um, I also wanted to say that um, the benefit agreement that Jessica asked for them to sign uh, or whatever that was for the, uh, the um, uh, neighbors, they won't commit to anything because their past, if you go by past performance, everything they've told us as neighbors, they've reneged on. Everything in the past that they told us, one, they would, if they got the school, they would never ever put parking across the street unless it was underground and it would only be a building. They were already reneging of that. Anything they tell you, if they have a change in the administration. These Mr. Beers leaves for more money someplace else. The next person's going to say, well, it doesn't matter what they said. That's the only credibility problem that the neighbors have. That's why they're so upset, because everything they've told us in the past, they've reneged on or just has, haven't carried through. The dumpsters, when I ask them to please just put put a sound barrier around the dumpsters across the street from my house, they wouldn't do it. They just ignored it. Yes, you, they have a place you can call, and sometimes they'll do something, but they don't always. You ask them for something, they don't ignore you. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Doris. Once again, if you could please state your name and your address, appreciate it. Thank you. I'm Laura Augustini, I'm president of the Green Ridge Neighborhood Association, and I live on Grandview Street in Scranton. Um, as has been said, about a year ago, uh, the neighborhood associations got together with Don King and a couple of others with regards to this zoning ordinance. I am in favor of the zoning ordinance being passed because it is something that we need, we have needed for over 30 years. It's the old zoning, zoning, zoning ordinance is just not working anymore. But I have to say that 
while um, adjustments were made for various neighborhood associations, it's, you have to remember that it is the neighborhoods that build Scranton, the neighborhoods that are a foundation of Scranton. When you make a change to an R1A zone, as soon as you make it into a less restrictive zone, within seven to 20 years, the property values decrease. With decreased property values, you have decreased tax income. We're already struggling here with taxes for the city of Scranton. We're one of the highest taxed uh, municipalities, if not the highest taxed municipality. I live in Green Ridge, and my house is a modest home, but I do know that Green Ridge, because we're an R1A zone, we pay over 25% of the, the, the property taxes for the city of Scranton. And I know that the Hill, because they're also an R1A zone, they pay a significant portion of the property taxes of Scranton. So as the values of those R1A zones decrease, so, de so decreases the income, the property tax income for the city of Scranton. Um, the CMC, they talked about the community co compensation and how they give back to the community um, and, and that it includes $74 million. And I believe a, probably a huge portion of that is in uncompensated care. Well, that doesn't pay my DPW to pick up my garbage. I'm sorry about you know, people who don't have insurance or that there's issues with that, but paying for someone's uncompensated care, whether they're for, from Scranton or Mayfield or Tunkatnik, that doesn't pay the salary of the, the DPW worker who, who provides services here in Scranton. Um, I also thought that the ER was expanded in the past 10 years or so. I seem to recall a lot of construction. So I'm wondering why, why we have to do this all over again. I'm not saying that it's not needed, but I do question that. Um, CMC also talked about absor absorbing the ER, the ER closure of Moses Taylor. We just had a new hospital open up in Dixon City. Um, I would assume that they're going to be absorbing a portion of that as well. So the burden doesn't fall all on CMC. Again, I'm grateful for the time that has been spent on the, the revamp and listening for, uh, to all of the concerns about the, from the neighbors and the neighborhood associations. But I do think that you need to take into account that the changes that the CMC or that Geisinger is looking for, they can be modified. And the, the Hill Neighborhood Association and the neighbors in the Hill section that are directly affected by this um, change, they certainly, they're willing to compromise. And I think that Geisinger has not been as forthcoming as we would like. Um, uh, was brought up that a question was asked about, you know, was it fully staffed? And I likened it to, instead of telling you the time, they told you how to build a watch. They gave you nothing. And I, that was frustrating for me to hear. Again, I, I do think the zoning ordinance needs to be passed, but I think it needs to be amended so that the uh, 200 block of Colfax is restricted to the 45-foot height. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Hi, I'm Dave Cauley. I'm a 24-year resident of 1724 Vine Street, and Geisinger is not a good neighbor. Um, they tore down those houses. First snow came along, they did not clear the sidewalks. The city had to be called and told that they didn't do that. And then they finally came out and did that, and they, there were delays every time it snowed or there was ice or anything like that. Um, we have asked about information about what they want to do. They have mostly ignored us or given us fluff like they gave you guys. You asked questions, they did not answer them. They asked about staffing. They said, well, it's kind of hard. We don't know if they're going to staff it at all. They want to put beds in. Beds make money. Parking spots don't make money, but they sure have a damn good plan for parking spots. But they won't tell you how many beds they're going to put in, or they tell you things that you want to hear, like they might say they're going to do some pediatrics, or they're going to do geriatric care. and. But when you ask them, they don't have a plan, you have to give them a blank check in order for them to come up with a plan. I know a few of you folks are business people and in the construction industry. Somebody spends $3 million or, or so on 
buying houses and tearing them down, and they don't actually have a plan for what they're going to do, do you believe them, or do you think they're full of crap? That's the basic question. You can, show of hands, how many people on the you know, council here think there's not a model sitting on a table in somebody's office in Danville? Okay, so no hands went up. So I'm assuming you don't believe them either when they say, oh, we don't have a plan. Because you wouldn't spend all that money if you did not have a plan. You're not gonna buy three blocks of property and tear it down if you don't have a plan. They don't want to tell us what their plan is because they know we're not going to like the plan. Yes, we do need updated uh, medical care. It would be nice if they showed us what the plan was and said, this is what we need to do. We're getting our asses handed to us by all the other hospitals that are moving into the area. We need to do something or we're screwed. Okay. Be honest with us. Say, this is what we want to do. How can we make this not a nightmare for you, the people who have to live there? Simple thing. If you have a neighbor, which I'm sure you all do, you want to do something in your yard that might impact your neighbor. Like you want to put something up and you say, hey, Bob, I'd like to do this. You know, it's you know, going to obstruct your view or something like that. What can I do to make it better? That's what good neighbors do. They have not done any of that. They don't care about us. They have no interest in making our life better. They just want to add beds so they can add revenue. That's all, it, all this is. Our lives and our you know, houses and decades of living in an area don't matter to them. Nobody who makes these decisions in Danville live in Scranton. They certainly don't live in the Hill section. And the few times we did talk to people at CMC, they gave us the guy who's in charge of facilities of, of the building up there. He, you know, they could have just given us a janitor for all, that, for all that mattered. That guy had no say. All he could say is, I don't know. I haven't seen any plans because, yeah, they haven't shown him any plans because he's not high enough to know anything. They just have not been good neighbors. They have not been forthcoming on anything. They have a plan. They haven't told you what the plan is, or maybe they did and you haven't told us. Either way, they have a whole lot of money that they're going to spend and they don't care what the people who live there think or how they're going to impact our life. The only thing that can restrict them is the zoning. That's it. What you guys decide impacts our life. And whatever they put in the paper, whatever they put on TV, whatever they told you personally, it's probably a pile of crap because they know what you want to hear in order to get your vote for their plan, which they're not telling anybody about until they build it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Good evening, my name is Maggie Craig and I live at 536 Colfax. Thank you, Council, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I grew up in Dixon City, moved to New York City when I was 18, came back to the area during the pandemic and just bought a house in the Hill section in January. And I love Scranton, I love the Hill section. I think Scranton's changed a lot in the past five, 10 years partially thanks to leaders like yourselves. And, you know, I also have a background. I'm a bartender in the Hill section and a writer, but I went to NYU for environmental studies with a focus in urban sustainability. And I think this idea that one neighborhood has to be diminished in order to serve the city as a whole just isn't necessarily true. I think there's a way to expand healthcare in the area as well as supporting the neighbors who live around Geisinger. And it just doesn't make sense to me that 60 feet on a parking garage would equate to less healthcare. And I don't think the information we were given today 
supports the need for a building that high. I don't think the question of why the parking garage needs to be that high was answered. And I'll leave you with this. I believe creativity flourishes within restrictions. And they said themselves today, Geisinger is great at thinking outside of the box. So you all get to determine what those restrictions are. And I feel confident that if those restrictions are in place, there's a way we can still have the health care that this community direly needs. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, good evening. My name is John Kevra, and I live at the 400 block of Arthur Avenue. Geisinger's presentation was very informative. It truly was the most information Geisinger has presented to concerned neighbors since the project was made known to us. However, we are all very familiar with the saying, talk is cheap. In no way, shape, or form have the citizens of Scranton seen real evidence that Geisinger is concerned with our city, our neighborhood, our largest city park, our museum, or our local economy. They have not shown any evidence of their commitment to anything but literally the bulldozing interest of Geisinger's uncompromising expansion. However, I can offer nine concrete pieces of evidence that they are not concerned with the residents of Scranton. Number one, during their presentation, they mentioned medical facilities that are closing but failed to mention the recent opening of the Lehigh Valley Hospital that is a formidable healthcare provider. Number two, also during the presentation, we heard expressions such as, I think, we feel. However, their slides were lacking the source information that is important when considering how accurate it is, something Dr. Fairchild, as an academic, could certainly appreciate. Number three, the initial meeting held one year ago was not an exchange of concerns and information. It was simply a presentation by three Geisinger employees of how we need more health care in Scranton something no one doubted in the room and probably no one doubts in this room tonight. Number four, for the, furthermore, the Scranton meetings with smaller groups were even more rhetoric than the initial meeting. The Geisinger employees had uh, less concrete answers to our questions than they had for you tonight. Number five, Mr. Barris said, we made a commitment to our neighbors when? When? I, I have no idea when he made this commitment. And what is it? Once again, we have seen no evidence of those words they expressed tonight. Number six, Geisinger is not willing to do the various studies such as traffic, sunshine, noise, etc., until the neighbors are held hostage to the proposed zoning changes. If they are truly committed to the neighbors, why are they not concerned about the quality of their lives and their safety? Number seven, in the presentation, they offered their unsourced information that supports their argument, but they can't tell us how many, uh, how many ER bays they will have, only that they currently have 38. I find that very hard to believe that a 300 plus million dollar project, and they don't know where they're going, but yet they had all that information about the need for the growth. Number eight, they mentioned a hotline and flyer N never mentioned in the two meetings we had. If that were something that I were presenting supporting my argument and I were an employee of Geisinger, I would have given that 1-800 number its own slide to prove that they have it. So after this meeting, each one of you could have dialed it. And number nine, Geisinger's use of NAOG parking keeps the park safe, busier, and overall more user friendly. Why would a concerned community member want to take this away? As the traffic moves from seven o'clock shifts to three o'clock shifts to 11 o'clock shifts, there's police there, there's activity. If any of us remember the park from the 1970s where that activity was gone, it was more like a drug fest than a city park. So once again, concerned citizens would care about that. They would give that consideration. So what are my concerns based upon the lack of evidence that I have for Geisinger, and sh you should have as well? What if the studies that come after the zoning changes indicate that there's going to be problems with pollution? That's not just a, a, a problem the local neighborhood people will have. It's a problem everyone in this room will have. 
What about the noise? What about the traffic? Are they willing to change their plans? Something tells me once they have exactly what they want, they won't care what those studies say. How do we know they will really create a neighborhood council? Nothing in their behavior to date indicates that they are willing to do that. And how, will they, how do we know that if they do create a, city, uh, a neighborhood council, they'll listen to what we have to say once again? No evidence, they've offered no evidence, but I'm offering you nine concrete bits of information as to how they cannot be trusted. So the question I pose to you is, are you putting Scranton first or Geisinger first? No one is saying they shouldn't grow. All they're saying is the way they're going about it is untrustworthy, it's unjust, and it's unfair, and it's up to you to vote to support the neighbors. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Kevra. Good evening. My name is Karen Sexton, and I live in the 200 block of Wheeler Avenue. I am here tonight representing my friend and former classmate, Sandy Mosier, who resides on Roseland Street and has asked me to read this letter on her behalf. Dear council members, as the current family member residing in the Mosier family home of the last 80 years on Roseland Street, with the ability to enjoy natural morning sunlight on our front porches and yards, a 100-foot parking garage that is being proposed for the corner of Roseland Street and Colfax Avenue will and would be a detriment to our neighborhood. The clean air and peaceful enjoyment of our neighborhood will be severely compromised, as we will be subjected to the following. 365 days, 24 hours, seven days a week per year. No AM sunshine excessive vehicle gas and exhaust fumes, beeping of vehicles locking and unlocking, vehicle alarms being activated, excessive lighting of garage penetrating bedroom windows, transients and vagrants using garage staircases for shelter, etc. Excessive traffic on Roseland Street, plus the potential abuse of the one-way street, excessive speeders on Roseland Street. As you can see, there is nothing positive for our neighborhood. At this time, I would like you to imagine yourself in our situation being subjected to what you are contemplating of, of approving, being built across the street from your own home. Is this if this is allowed to happen in this neighborhood, what and whose neighborhood is next? I implore, implore the members of the council to consider our community's quality of life over the demands of Geisinger. Thank you for your consideration of these concerns. Sincer sincerely, Sandra Mosier. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Gary Sheckman. I live at 222 Colfax Avenue. Uh, my family bought the, our home uh, in 1961, so we've been there about 62 years. I wanted to thank uh, the members of the community uh, who have been uh, organized to, uh, to help control uh, what's been going on in the neighborhood. I know they've worked uh, count countless hours. Uh, I have to say that uh, the reason why there's not a lot more people here tonight is because uh, our opponents or the, or, uh, who we have to go up against, they have bulldozers. So basically, on my street, there's four homes left, five homes, four homes, I believe, on the two of Colfax. I'm a little confused. I, I hear about... Uh, different zoning for half of the block, the other, 
I, I, don't, I don't understand it, but I do understand that they want to put a, a 100 foot garage across the street. And I think uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, the last speaker uh, probably put it most uh, the best way. Like, how would you like it? How would you like it to wake up to a 100 foot garage? And uh, I know there's a big concern these days about secondhand smoke. Can you imagine a garage that size right across the street from your from your home? Just it just doesn't seem uh, it just doesn't seem right. So uh, I can appreciate that the CMC has uh, growth needs. Uh, you know, God forbid we all get in situations we need the hospital, and thank God they're there. I'm just hoping that uh, there's some accommodation that could be made for uh, people who've uh, spent their whole life in their neighborhood, you know, have uh, spent tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes, and uh, to see what's happened is very disheartening, and uh, I hope you'll uh, consider what I've had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Is there anyone else who would like to be heard? Good evening, Council Lee Morgan. You know, I, I hope I could have got in here earlier and heard the discussion that was taking place, but it was kind of crowded. I'll watch it <clears throat> on ECTV. But i just like to say that I don't know how this fits in the uh, SAPA plan, and I'm really concerned about spot zoning to, de to uh, benefit a, a development in the city at the detriment of the rest of the residents because it smacks of politics. Now, I'm a firm believer that there's a lot of pay-to-play politics in this city, and um, not only do I believe it, but Mr. Gaham believes it, and he was council president here. And, you know, I lived on the Hill from 16 on, lived right across from the University of Scranton. My grandmother lived in the Morton Apartments at that time, and I lived on the 400 of Monroe. And I watched what the university, and a lot of people aren't gonna appreciate what I say here, but I watched the University of Scranton destroy the hill and force families out of their neighborhoods. And just, the only thing that's left standing there are the churches now. All the people that I grew up around and they've been dispersed, their families that lived in the city for generations are gone and forced out of their neighborhoods, and the social fabric of the neighborhood was destroyed. And I remember George Uhas, who lived um, on, Mon on Mulberry Street there, being an advocate to save the Scranton State General Hospital. And I remember the surgeon there, who was on Channel 16, talking about saving the state hospital because of its location in the city and its, and its size and, and the amount of health care it could furnish. Not only did it had a drug treatment center, but, and we fettered all these things away. And now what we've come to is we've come to a NAOG park that's talking about building a pool and maybe the rec authority enhancing the park itself. But how will those plans be constrained by a major project like this hospital expansion. And, you know, my heart goes out to the people here that live in those neighborhoods because they're talking about money pushing them out of their neighborhoods and d destroying the social fabric of their neighborhood. And I personally think myself that when the zoning maps were redrawn, they did it to hide the fact that they were going to do a lot of favors for Geisinger. And that's my own opinion. And, and I think, look, at this all has to stop here today. And what Geisinger needs to do is it needs to go down into the heart of the city, down in, maybe down by North Washington Avenue, where there's a lot of decay and a lot of open land, and build a hospital there. They've got plenty of money, and the state and the federal government are giving to give them grant money. And build a, a hospital closer to the medical school and let's start consolidating our assets in a way that makes some kind of common sense instead of building a monstrosity on the top of the hill. And don't forget, we put choke points on Mulberry Street when we narrowed it. 
Okay, so it's not this wide open boulevard. Okay, it's not what it was when I was a kid. We've made very, very poor choices here. And we're about to make another one because I think that this council needs to come forward, bring the zoning changes that they're going to make to this whole city, and show it to the residents to explain how this follows SAPA's plan that the city agreed to and how it benefits residents and what kind of development they're actually talking about bringing into these areas because I think we've lost the idea on what we want to create in this city. And I think that following a flawed plan is going to cause a lot of harm. And telling Geisinger that we don't support this plan even though you've invested money into it, we think you need to move your project. And take a look down at the lower hill where I'm talking about. It's vacant. There's a couple old factories there that are left that are empty where Ralph e. Weeks used to have his places and, and others across the um, across that whole corridor down by the, by the medical school. It's a development where you could build a helicopter pad and you have a lot of room for expansion. It's right off the Central Expressway. It has a lot of wide avenues. There aren't a lot of neighborhoods down there, so noise wouldn't be a problem or, or, or pollution. And save the remnants of what's left in this neighborhood, because my neighborhood on the hill was destroyed by the University of Scranton. Okay, and I don't think we should just subject the people of Scranton to more harm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Joan Hodawan, it's 101 Penn Avenue, Scranton. I don't have much new to say, and I, but I, I got to get up here and tell you, I came here tonight and spending like hours and hours here hoping to hear some specifics from Geisinger. When, remember, you said last week, well, we're going to bring him in and we're going to ask them questions, and you did. You asked them some, some pretty specific questions, and you got a lot of humma humma, blah, blah, blah. No yes or no answers, okay? And this whole explanation, well, you know, we can't really make specific plans until we know what the zoning ordinance is going to look like. Let me tell you something. If you didn't get a bad feeling tonight and see some red flags, you weren't listening. I know nothing about medicine. I know nothing about how to build a parking garage. But I do know when someone's a snake oil salesman, and it came very close tonight. Yeah. The doctor was pretty good, but the CEO, you know, if he gives up his uh, day job, he ought to go and become a politician. He's got all the qualifications. Never answer directly a question. For example, the slide that had the pilots, you know, they were going to talk about pilots and taxes and everything. They didn't really talk about it. I saw something up there about $600 million. And oh, you know, our people, our employees, and even our patients and our visitors, you know, they buy gas and they go to the restaurant or whatever, you know, kind of thing, $600 million. Let me tell you something. This whole concept of them as a not-for-profit, is that not a load of horse hooey? Do you think that CEO took a vow of poverty? Oh, no, he's probably laughing all the way to the bank. It's clear in my mind that, yes, we need improved health care in the city, and they do have to grow, and they do have to expand, and technology has to advance and all that. You know, I, I don't argue that. We need doctors, we need nurses, we need to pay them a good wage, all of that, okay? But the fact that they wouldn't make any commitments, red flag. What about this thing I heard for the first time tonight about Bloomsburg and how they halted their, their plan down there? What's to prevent them from halting it here after you give them a green light with the zoning ordinance? What they want is for you to give them what they need, but they're not giving you any commitments. Oh, no, because they're going to do the studies after the zoning ordinance. Then they'll find out what they can or cannot do. They didn't really want to talk about something like, why can't they, you know, maybe get another 
large satellite parking area somewhere in Scranton and use a shuttle service and get their employees to and from work, why do they need to have 1,200 or 1,400 parking spaces? I'm not really sure I understood that concept where they wouldn't look at any other options, okay? Don't want to commit to an underground parking level until they do the studies, but they aren't going to do the studies until after the zoning ordinance is approved. Well, I just hope that, you know, I mean, they didn't give you some hard and fast answers tonight. You give them a green light next week, okay, you better be prepared to live with what's going to happen the next five to ten years, because I think the people are going to remember for a long, long time. Thank you, Ms. Sotomayor. Tom Coyne, Manuka, Oak Avenue, Manuka. Uh, first of all, I'd like to address that we need to watch a closer, uh, uh, closer attention to the starting clock, because when the lady in the leopard skin neck wrap was up here, uh, when she started to speak, it was actually uh, three minutes and 23 seconds on the clock. The clock had already been running, and she was stripped of one minute and 40 seconds of her speaking time. Now, for the health care, I'm not devoid of understanding of it. My grandmother was an RN in this city. She was an RN for 66 years. Yes, she was up in her 80s when she finally retired from being an RN. I remember her in the nursing homes, and she worked up at a place called Still Meadow, which was for disadvantaged children. My mother was an LPN. I understand the hardships that hospital workers go through. She, after dealing with patients and home patient care, and having patients eventually pass away because it was the end of life, it finally became too much of a burden for her, and she left nursing as an LPN to move in and become a lawyer. That tells you that with the law and going before the courts is sometimes easier and going back to school for a law degree than having to suffer the stresses of being a nurse in the system. I've worked in the industry for 16 plus years as a health care provider by providing equipment, IT, data analysis, and expertise on billing. I'm not devoid of an information on how a large organization like this runs. This main speaker referred to the council as your honor, and then he went off on monologues. Like good counsel, he dodged direct questions. In 2001, GMC provided more than $74 million in community benefits, including uncompensated care. That's all well and good, except by federal mandate, they're required as being a hospital to provide uncompensated care. It's not a gift, it's not a pilot, it's a requirement by federal law for them being a hospital. If they do not provide private care, they cannot be a hospital. So saying it's a pilot or any benefit like that is complete bunk. It's regulated for them for having the ability to be a hospital and to accept Medicare. It's disingenuous. Oh, and he's talked about people dropping off dry cleaning. I haven't seen very many dry cleaning places in the city. It must be a very elite crowd that goes up there that's worried about running to drop off their dry cleaning. Exit beeping from facilities. I don't understand why we have exit beeping, considering that Philadelphia and other major cities put flashing strobe lights outside the garage and warning signs that say stop for flashing signs for pedestrians that say stop when someone is exiting. It's visible, it's clear, and it's not a noise producer. I don't know why we need beeping on a garage when a ground level flashing strobe light takes care of the situation without noise. They say that doctors and nurses well, you have to wait for over, sometimes over eight hours. And the lady, oh, she, she had this abdominal issue, and then they had to revive her after five hours of waiting there. 
Well, maybe if they, under their triage, if they are unable to take care of the patients in a timely manner, they should coordinate with other hospitals to transport to hospitals that are not overburdened. Because having someone in the hospital for eight hours, risking them as an emergency patient, is insane. If you're beyond capacity, do not be beyond capacity. Triage and transport the people out of there who can be transported. And the newspaper wrote a, an article about the backlog of dialysis patients. Well, considering they have a large property that they wanted a 100 foot, 100 foot uh, down near the school, where they want to put in another building, that's the perfect place to put a dialysis and all that scheduled services so that they don't need to expand as much up there because they can take scheduled services that are now in the hospital complicating it and moving it to another place that is not impacted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coyne. Is there anyone else like to be heard? I'm Joe Matijevich, live on Far Street, vice president of the Trip Park Civic Association, executive board member of the Bulls Head West and Field Neighborhood Association. I come here tonight to stand with our neighbors and friends in the Hill. Neighborhoods built this city. The houses were there long before Geisinger had expanded. Geisinger is not going anywhere. The tradesmen who are here talking about their jobs, they do tremendous work. They're still going to have work. What this council needs to do is to take care of the many, not the few or the one. These people here voicing their concern need you to hear their concern, listen to their concern, and take the appropriate action and vote for the people, not for Geisinger. When, when they were building the Isaac Tripp School, the neighbors had some issues. We opened the doors of the community center. We had them come in. We had school board members come in. Issues were solved. There was a problem with the baseball field. It's not there no more. You know, that's what neighborhoods do, working with people who want to make change. Down in Bull's Head, they needed people to manage that flood project. Not just Weston Field and Bull Head, Bull's Head. They went all the way over to the plot in Lower Greenridge when they wanted to expand and bring North Scranton Junior High School back to life. Who wrote the letters? We did, because the neighbors were concerned, and as neighbors, we stick together. What I'm here tonight is to ask this council to take those friendly amendments that were made a few weeks back by Mr. Schuster, seconded by Mr. McAndrew, died on a three to two vote to not to move those forward, put them back on the table tonight, because as Mr. McAndrew said, from that wall to that wall is two levels of a parking garage. What Mr. Schuster said tonight is, let's put those amendments in and let them come before the five members of the zoning board and ask for a variance. If they prove the variance by the rules, then let's go with that. But we cannot allow this to happen for this height to impact these people's lives who built these properties for many, many years because remember, NIMBY, not in my backyard, might be coming in your backyard when they want to put something bigger in your neighborhood. So I'm asking you here tonight to take into consideration what Mr. McAndrew and Mr. Schuster said, put those amendments on the table, vote them, and then next week pass it 3-2 because if you don't take the amendments, these people are going to suffer, all the neighborhoods are going to suffer. You can take that off the, out of eighth order tonight, put it there, it'll pass 3-2, and this has all been an exercise in futility. So I ask you to consider that. Take the people's voice first, because the people need to be heard. And the people built our city, not Geisinger. The people are going to stay, and Geisinger's not going anywhere. So I implore you to do that tonight, and make sure these people at least have a voice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Matijevich. Edmonds, Kikidi, Arthur Avenue. I wasn't going to speak tonight, Mr. King, until you said something for the first time that encouraged me for all the times I've appeared here before this body. And that is when you suggested about extending the garage on Colfax Avenue to 75 feet. 
uh, to allow for a reduction on the garage on the 200 block of Colfax. It, it was interesting in the context of Mr. Beer's comment that they love surface parking. They have surface parking. You asked him to give you a figure on how many parking spaces that would create. I hope they can do that. And I hope if they don't do that, you wait to decide what you're going to do with the zoning ordinance. But in addition to that, I would ask you to ask Mr. Beer, with a 45-foot garage in the two of Colfax, coupled with the 45-foot garage on the four of Colfax, and the park, how many spaces do they have? None of the neighbors here are throwing them out of the park. We like having them there for some of the reasons that you heard earlier, safety, security, activity. It's a good thing. The city is not going to want to have to just look at seven acres of blacktop if they move out of there. What are you going to do? You're going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars going in there, rip up the blacktop and make it a green space? That's never going to happen. Never going to happen. So you have the authority to pick up the phone, essentially, and say, look, this is what we want to do. Stay in the park. Build the 45-foot garage in the two of Colfax and the four of Colfax, and everything from a parking standpoint will be addressed. It is not a major give back. The neighbors who are here this evening agreed months ago to back off our request that it remain strictly residential to the compromise, some of which is part of what's before you as the amendments of the zoning ordinance. As a legal lesson, if we can't resolve this as responsible, intelligent people, we're going to have a decision by this board which will be appealed then to the Zoning Hearing Board. And the Zoning Hearing Board will then get an opportunity to decide whether or not it's a spot zoning issue. And depending on what the Zoning Board does, there's an appeal to the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania. So instead of having a project or a SAPA ordinance that's finally resolved within a matter of weeks, this case, this situation could hang on 18 months, 24 months, 30 months, until all appeals are exhausted. And that 18-month window that Mr. Beer talked about before they even turn or shovel is now five years out. So let's use some common sense here. Let's protect the people who put you where you are, who pay for you to sit here and to listen to us. You don't get that from Geisinger. You get that from us. And we'll remember how this vote goes when it's all said and done. Because those of you who want to repeat performance on the council will have to come back to the voters for their help. And you see tonight, not only from this group, but from the other neighborhood groups, that there's support for that amendment. If you don't pass the amendment, please understand that if there's an appeal that's resolved in favor of the neighbor's spot zoning argument, it doesn't go back to this proposed compromise. It goes back to residential. So for all the time and effort and money spent in this thing, fighting over 60 feet of garage, this project could be delayed for years, and eventually it could turn out that some higher court decides that it was or is spot zoning, and it doesn't come back to 45-foot garages. It comes back to residential zoning. So I think this is a lot to think about. There's a lot at risk here for everybody. But the compromise that we've already asked to be considered only to have it rebuked by this 100-foot garage in the tool of Colfax, it's not a leap of faith for Geisinger to take the 45-foot garage. Keep the park. Ask them how many spaces they will have with those two garages and the park, and I'm sure it's going to be at or near what they're saying they're going to have by drawing all of their employees out of the park, which they're never going to do anyway. And then we're left with seven acres of blacktop and nothing to do with it. I don't remember any more traveling circuses coming around, so I don't think there'll be much that you're going to do with that area. They're using it. We don't mind they're using it. There's a benefit to the city. That is the compromise, and that is the role that this council can play in resolving this thing to everybody's satisfaction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So anyone else who would like to be heard? Hearing none, I'll seek a motion to adjourn. 
Motion to adjourn. This public hearing is adjourned. We'll take a three, four minute break before we begin the council meeting.